Welcome back to the Get Loved Up podcast, your number one resource for inspiration and motivation to live your purpose, make healthy living a priority, and thrive doing what you love. I'm your host, Koya Webb, a small town girl who chased her dreams and caught them, a former track and field athlete who healed using spirituality and yoga, and an entrepreneur who didn't let sexual assault racism and insecurities dim her light. And now it's your turn to allow these episodes with some of the top voices in spirituality, wellness, and entrepreneurship to inspire you to thrive. Let's get loved up together. Faith Hunter is a yoga and meditation teacher, as well as the creator of Spiritually Fly, a lifestyle philosophy that celebrates every moment of life. A teacher for over 20 years, Hunter has owned celebrated yoga studios in D.C. and now has Elevate, a digital and in-person experience for interconnection and personal growth. One of the most recognizable faces in yoga, Hunter has appeared in Yoga Journal, Essence, Women's Health, Shape, and New York Magazine. Learn more at faithhunter.com. Thanks! (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> hello girlfriend what's up girl it's so good to see you it has been so long and i've been so anticipating this this episode that i hope you're ready to just deep dive uh, i'm ready to go there let's do it <laughs> First of all, I just have to go back to when we first met. And I don't know if you remember, but we were at this outdoor, I don't remember what festival you might, but I remember looking at you and thinking like, she is so beautiful. You had curly hair. And I think I was just deciding to do the big chop and chop my perm off. Oh, wow. It was a long time. I don't know how many years ago, but that's when I first met you. Oh my goodness. Whoa. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Do you remember that event that I'm talking about? You know, I, the only thing I could think it probably could have been is like maybe a Wonderlust or something. It was like a Wonderlust. I remember I was making raw foods. You were doing yoga. We were out. It was dusty. I was teaching kids in a teepee. I actually still have the video oh. of kids in a teepee. It has hmm. over, maybe over, I want to say, a, 15 years ago. <laughs> oh, snap. Really? That's how long we've been in the game. <laughs> you know what? I, I realize how, you know, I always realize how old I am when I um, see one of my friends who actually work with me at my yoga studio when I see her son, because I, I gave her son his first job <gasps> and, and he was like 19. Now he's like 20 something. Wow. Yeah. That's been, that's been a minute. That's been such a minute. Can you share, like, I, I want people to really get to know you because a lot of people only know you through yoga yeah. um, and what you're doing in the yoga space, but I want you to give us a little bit before yoga. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. So a little bit before yoga, a lot of people think that I, because I've been on the East coast for so long that I'm like either from DC or New York, but I'm not, I'm originally from Louisiana. I try and like, you know, put that out a little bit from time to time, but I'm originally from Louisiana. Actually, that's when I started practicing yoga Mm -hmm. and, and doing meditation. And at the time, my brother, my older brother, Michael was um, dealing with complications related to AIDS. And one of my friends was like, look, maybe you should try some yoga. I heard it helps you relax. And I was like, okay, but instead of it helping, well, it did, I shouldn't say it didn't help me relax, but It just allowed me, I always tell people, it allowed me a space to cry because I didn't know what kind of yoga I was taking. I stepped into a kundalini class. Oh. (laughs) So it was like, boom, you're going to face it all right now. And so that happened. And oops, I kept, um, I kept like, practicing and doing yoga. And then I moved to the East coast to do nonprofit work. I worked in HIV and AIDS. I worked for a couple, I worked for the CDC for a while as a contractor. I did um, stuff on the Hill. I was advocate. I worked for the national minority AIDS council. That was like one of the last major nonprofit jobs I did, took. And I was a director of, um, 
technical training and capacity building. So I would actually go into local nonprofits. I would travel, which I've always had this travel book. So I would travel literally around the U.S. and support small grassroots organizations and helping them basically revamp their organizations, revamp their programs and stuff. Because I have an MBA. A lot of people don't know that either. Um, So my background is in business. So then I like fast forward. I quit that job, became a yoga teacher, moved to New York, became a yoga teacher, and then moved back to DC. And since then, I've been going back and forth. So how many years ago is that now? Like how many years have you been a yoga teacher? Uh, I graduated in 2003. Girl. That was a long time. I say 18 years. Yeah. Yeah. And did you feel, because I think having a family member that's going through a life-threatening, um, you know, illness is, you know, it's not easy. I'm sure, you know, like you say, you're experiencing um, stress and crying. Do you feel like that yoga helped you process or did it take many things years later to help you process the pain? It helped me to start processing it. And it was actually, it took years for me to move through all of it because when I started practicing, he was just in his decline. He had just started his decline. He spent probably like about a year of fighting. We spent probably, I want to say almost eight to nine months in the hospital. So I was seeing him almost every single day suffering. And that's when I started practicing. And then after his death, then it took like a whole nother collection of years to like work through that. And then at the same time of doing yoga and meditating and all of that, I was, I also decided to go to therapy. Mm-hmm. Cause that's he's my older brother. I mean, he was like my, my savior. I mean, he, we were together and we had, we shared the same birthday month. So we were both Virgos. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. I know it's not easy, but I know some people listening are mm-hmm. going through loss. And yeah. I love that you said therapy, you know, and a lot of people now are really removing that stigma and really talking about like not how only yoga meditation, but also therapy can provide that outlet. What do you feel was the most helpful? Was it the therapy? Was it the meditation? Was it the yoga? Was it the combination? I think it was more of a combination of both because I actually, I experienced therapy younger like Mm -hmm. even before I started doing yoga. So I was familiar with it. Actually, when both of my brothers, because not only my older brother, but my younger brother was diagnosed with HIV at the same time, we did some therapy. I mean, it was just simple counseling, but at least I I wasn't unfamiliar with it and I was comfortable with it. It was a little more normalized. And it's really fascinating because we went through therapy, but my mom is probably the one that was the most resistant. You know, because within, especially within black communities, it's like, no, that is something we don't do. However, my dad did it, which was really for him. It was like um, mind blowing when I think about it, because most black men don't go to therapy. I mean, even in this day and age, I mean, it's slowly becoming more of a norm. But I think because I knew that that was something that supported me, journaling was a big part of my therapy. That's something I've carried into my yoga and having all of those modalities and tools helped. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm telling you, therapy, I feel like I love that people are talking about it more, sharing about it more, because I think just knowing someone else is going through it helps people say, okay, maybe I should try it. Maybe I should Mm -hmm. try it as a man, as a woman. So, so, so important. And so as you start, once you got your certification, were you at the beginning saying, I wanted to teach, or were you just doing it for your own healing? Um, It started out originally for my own healing, but then I also didn't have a job. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I was like, well, I guess I can still make some money. So I actually started teaching at the facility where I did my yoga teacher training. And it was great because I was working the front desk anyway. And so it just like flowed in. And then my brother, actually, my younger brother was living in DC at the time. And he goes, hey, I'm dating this girl. She says yoga's not that great here in DC, maybe you should come down here, come back to DC and, and teach. And so I was like, yeah, I'm kind of tired of New York. I'll go back to DC. Mm -hmm. And so I did. Yeah. And then that's when I had a really big awakening Mm -hmm. because in New York, I was able to teach and be a yoga teacher full time, 
when I moved to DC, the scene was not like that. That was like 2007. So mm-hmm. it was a whole different ball game. And I was like, oh, dang, I have to go back to nonprofit. Oh, no. <laughs> so I did. I went back to nonprofit. I went back to nonprofit and taught yoga part time and then opened up a yoga studio, my first studio. Wow. That's, that's incredible. That's incredible. And so you've always been like an entrepreneur at heart, right? Cause you just like, oh yeah, I'm in your backgrounds in business. So mm-hmm. what happened during this? Cause I know you've been through a lot and I don't know how deep you want to go. We can go deep, girl. We can go deep. I, I think it's so important. I think it's so important, Faith, because I just yeah. know a little bit about your story. I know most people don't. Mm-hmm. You know, and one of the reasons that I was really excited about having this because I want people to know what you've been through because you have been through so much. And through it all, you've still been able to maintain your presence, but you've taken some time. Like you've taken some time of like healing and and, Mm -hmm. and clearing. So can you talk about from that, that time, you know, going through this, this family, um, you know, grief um, and then opening the studio. Can you take us on a timeline to now where you have your studio, you know, Mm -hmm. and but I want you to take people along your journey um, and, and how you use uh, the power of your practice to get you through. Yeah, I think by really dropping into what well, one under, you know, having that relationship with therapy, but then immediately when my brother, that was like the first, I want to say that was mostly the second tragedy because the first aspect of tragedy and trauma within our family was them being diagnosed. That was like in the early 80s. And then in the 90s is when my older brother died. And going through the yoga, that was like holding, I really fully felt like that practice was holding my physical body and my mental body together. Therapy was supporting me to get through the process, right? Yeah. And so then when I moved to DC, even when I was working in nonprofit, I was still practicing. Because I was, one, working in a very high-stress environment. I'm in D.C., so many A-types. I'm in the HIV-AIDS arena. We were trying to get all kinds of laws passed. Like, it, I was definitely in D.C. around the time we were, you know, still moving through Brian White and, like, just being advocates. And also, new drugs were coming out. So, there was just a lot mentally going on and there was still so much stigma because that was actually one of my jobs to help to remove stigma when I was a contractor for the CDC. And so again, yoga was present. Mm. Like, you know, I I remember there, a lot of my colleagues would like leave work and go to the bar. And I was like, I can't do that. (laughs) I didn't live in New Orleans and I used to do that, but I was like, I don't do that. (laughs) So I was like, I have to figure something else out. And so that's when I was like, okay, I can't find my yoga, but at least I have Rodney Yee on PBS. (laughs) Right. Do we all start with Rodney? (laughs) Always like go to PBS and check out Rodney Yee and, you know, DVDs were out and stuff like that. So that's what I would do. And then I do remember a couple of practices that, you know, from my my teachers that I learned in New Orleans. And then when I moved to New York, I moved there without a job. Um, fortunately I, I had a dude I was with, so I lived with him. Um, and so I didn't have a job and I was like, well, what am I going to do most of the summer? Well, most of the summer I took yoga. I just like literally bounced around to every one week unlimited that I could probably get my hands on. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way. I was like, literally, oh, let me try this studio. Let me try this studio. And I just kept bouncing around. And it was great because I was able to, one, check out so many different styles and techniques because I'd really only been exposed to what I thought yoga only was, was my Kundalini practice. And then I was only exposed to riding yeet. I didn't know anything else. And I was like, oh, my God, this vinyasa thing. What? Oh my God, this is so cool. I can move my body in all these ways, right? And it was it was just great because music was such a huge part of it as well. And I I back in the day, this whole nother piece, I used to be a DJ for like one semester in college. And of course, growing up as a dancer, music was so instrumental in in what I did. So being able to take vinyasa class, that was supporting me. So then once I became a yoga teacher, not only was it 
my teaching practice, which I really love my instructors, how they guided us. It's like you have your teaching practice, but you also need to maintain your personal practice and having that personal practice really sustain me. Fast forward, I moved to, back to D.C. I decided to open up a yoga studio. I'm still working in nonprofit. My personal practice was always there. Mm. Like it, it never fell off. Um, there were times that I struggled with my personal practice. But I always came back to it. And the really fascinating thing, there were so many practices once I did come back to D.C. that I was like, oh, this is my go to. Mm-hmm. Okay. This, uh, this is my go to meditation. This is my go to mantra. This, this is my go to, you know, Kundalini Kriya. Like it was like I had my go to's and that became my foundation, especially when I decided that. I did want to have a studio. And then at some point I'm, you know, I'm like on the cover of yoga journal. And now I'm, I'm like, Oh, wait a minute. None of this was in my plan. Cause I didn't really have a plan. <laughs> my plan was just to like teach yoga. And like, I didn't know anything else, you know, in terms of, and I was like, I was just convinced that I didn't want to go back to nonprofit. Like that was once I did quit that, but knowing that I had these very essential foundational practices continue to support me even through business drama as Mm -hmm. well as personal drama. Right. So, and getting in a little, a bit of that personal drama, how did you separate? I mean, I know right now in my community, we are talking about healthy boundaries and Mm. the yoga teacher, we're wanting to give, 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 give. So, Talk a little bit about your your personal and your professional and how you created healthy boundaries for yourself. Yeah, you know, actually, I'll, I'll share one of the, the stories and actually one of the it's a big story that's in my book. And it's in the I think it's in the first chapter where I really kind of lay out why I decided to take a year off of practicing when this is I'm like I'm in the middle of teaching, but I decided to take a full year off of practicing with other yoga teachers. I wouldn't go and take classes with anyone. I did. I went into my personal cave and the, what catapulted me into doing that and just focusing on my own personal practice was a toxic relationship that I was incapable of setting any boundaries for. And the only way that I was able to step away from that relationship and set some boundaries is that One, there was a level of abuse, Um, verbal abuse had been going on for a while. And then I experienced one episode of physical abuse. And I was like, holy snap, I got to go. Mm -hmm. And I just remember like the first night in my apartment, I had no furniture. I think I had a bench and the TV. (laughs) (laughs) It's a bench that travels with me everywhere. And my two dogs. And I'm just like, sitting there and I was like, all right, what's the Kriya? Mm. Time to do a 40 day practice. And I like fell back into what I knew was going to support me. And from there, I, I found the strength. I continue to like struggle with setting boundaries, even with that relationship. But I knew that the strength that I had to work that I worked through with my brother died in between my brother dying and this toxic relationship. My dad died. And in 2001, like it was just like, a. but I always came back Mm. to my personal practice. And that's when I made the commitment. I was like, I'm not going to practice with any other teachers for a year. I'm just going to sit with myself every time I possibly can. Cause I I don't want a repeat of this. Mm Mm-hmm. How about that? Like, it, like I was like, I don't know. I need to dige- like dissect why this relationship entered my life and what I did. So it was a year of personal practice. Mm, that's so beautiful. And I love that you're just like, you know, I had to sit with myself because I think that's so important because a lot of times we're just running and we're looking for the answers outside of ourselves. And really it mm-hmm. just takes us, sitting with ourselves and and reflecting on how we actually feel and why we feel the way we feel. I think that is so important. I know that takeaway is going to land with so many people. Mm -hmm. Um, And so now you have the healthy boundaries of, okay, I'm 
out of the toxic relationship. I'm back, you know, teaching. Do you ever feel like that you had to have healthy boundaries with your students? Did you ever feel like, you know, some students crossed the line? Because I know you, you know, you've been out there for a long mm-hmm. time. Yeah. You know, actually, I remember when I was teaching in New York, when I first started and I didn't know that people would step to me like that, you know, as like, as a yoga teacher, I was like, Oh my God, is this person hitting on me? Or, or is this person wanting more of my time and energy that I have the capacity to give? And so early on from my mentor, right, in in yoga teacher training, I asked her about it, like, because I didn't really understand all the, or really didn't know that I would have to deal with those type of ethics, right? And when you're on a job, a nine to five, you know, you, the HR person explains all the, the things, right? You have all that. But when you're out there as a yogi entrepreneur, you, you're like, especially a new one, and the industry was still new, mm. Right. And so fortunately, I had a great mentor that kind of like guided me. And this is like the rules that she gave herself were the ones that I made a choice to live by. And so I was very, very clear, you know, with my students. I've I've always been extremely clear with my staff. I yeah, I mean, sometimes some of my staff have told me, they're like, oh my God, you are cold sometimes. I'm like, no, got to go. All right, class is over. Thank you so much. Like I spin, get a little hugs and kisses and da, 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 da. But I'm out here. There were times where I would probably say 90% of my staff didn't even know where I lived. Mm. Because it's like, I just needed to have that space. Right. Yeah. yeah and, and I'm like walking around with my dog and they're like, do you live in the neighborhood? I'm like, no, mm. just taking a walk. Right. Yeah. Taking a walk, you know, because I need to make sure that I have my, my comfort zone, my quiet space, even when I'm like out at the park. Right. That's yeah. so, I think that's so powerful. I think pe- more people need to hear that and be given permission to like, you know, like have your personal space, have your personal time. You don't have to be with someone all of the time. And I think a lot of times it's beautiful. Community is beautiful. Friends are beautiful. Having Mm -hmm. a team is beautiful. But I think also having that, and I think that's what we had, like in the last year, we had a lot of time to go with it. So what do you feel like was your biggest takeaways from having more time, you know, just in solitude? Oh, my goodness. I think for me, the biggest takeaway was that I had an opportunity to do a, almost like a second deep dive, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. kind of in the same way that, you know, when I left that toxic relationship, that was over 10 years ago. And having this opportunity to just be in solitude with myself, I did a lot more, right, I because I'd been doing childhood regression and childhood reprogramming stuff years ago I'd done that and I kind of went back to it because I wanted to like I don't know I was I was so much more curious about my ancestry I was asking my mom a whole lot of other questions that had come up while I was writing my book and I think those questions that I've been asking her when I was writing the book started to bubble to the surface and I was like I need to ask more questions and those questions it kind of pushed me into doing a little more shadow work, doing a little more childhood reprogramming. And it was great. Like it was painful, but mm-hmm. when I came out of it, I was like, I was like, oh yeah. Hey, it's 2021. I love it. How is, um, because I don't think I've done like any childhood regression work. How is that different <laughs> from Akashic Records? So what you're actually doing as you're doing your childhood regression and reprogramming, you are actually going back into any childhood trauma or relationships or situations Mm -hmm. and crafting a whole new landscape and new picture. It may be people like actually having those individuals say apologize, even if they didn't know that they may have caused you harm Um, or you. I know one of the big things for me was speaking up for myself. Mm. And, you know, part of the piece, which is really fascinating, is like the big trauma around both of my brothers being HIV positive. I took on 
the role of being the very good daughter. And that kind of actually suppressed my voice. Mm. And so realizing that that's also the, the thing I craved the most was more of my mother's attention. Because her job, her role was like giving it all to them. But I was like, well, I don't want to cause stress. I'm going to like, I'm going to sit back. And so in my childhood reprogramming during the, during the beginning of the pandemic was all about reclaiming my voice mm. as a little girl. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. It's so interesting how when someone is in pain, when someone is hurting, you know, we, we tend to take the backseat and feel like, okay, well, we both can't be hurting at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so I love that you call that out. Like I had to reclaim my voice because even in that, that grief, you are also grieving too, and you needed time and attention and nurturing. And I, I think that's just so powerful to call out. So people listening can realize like, you know what? Yeah, I've been helping this person, but like, I need help. I need to help you. Yeah. I need a yeah. practice. Yeah. Did you notice like your practice changing over time? Because, you know, it's been over mm. 20 years, right? How, how has your, your practice um, evolved? Yeah, I think my practice definitely has evolved. You know, as, as individuals, we, we evolve. And I feel like if the things around us or the tools around us don't shift and change, that means that we're not moving very much. So what has happened is that, you know, I have, I've trained in so many different types of yoga and meditation practice and so forth. And I would say probably over the past 10 years, I've experienced the biggest shifts. And definitely in the past three to four years, my teaching practice has really been a pure reflection of my personal practice. Because mm -hmm. there were times where I was like, at home doing one thing. And then when I go to the studio, I was like, well, you know, it is 2011. Everybody wants their hardcore vinyasa. So that's what I would give them. But that wasn't necessarily what I would do at home when I'm being triggered or when I do at home, when I just need to, to feel this sense of ease. I was doing a restorative practice, but I didn't teach restorative. Right. I was just doing it for myself. And so what happened over the years, I was like, you know what? Y'all going to get what I get. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, I'm just like, so, and the people that want to show up for that will, they, they will, they will understand. Yeah. yeah. That's so beautiful. I think sometimes we don't realize, especially when you're very ambitious, you're an entrepreneur, you used to go, go, go. You think you need a hard workout too, mm -hmm. when actually you need like the opposite, you know, yes. the sort of um, poses, the yin, because it's all about harmony and, and balance, yeah. finding, finding that flow. Um, definitely. Where did you get, what made you decide on uh, Spiritually Fly? I know this was the name of <laughs> book before it was the name of your book, but I want you to tell me just kind of the, the creation of spiritually fly yeah. um, and then why you chose it as the name of your book. Sure. So the, the spiritually fly actually came about with my first studio and in my first studio was called Shakti mind body and I had a business partner. And so every Sunday I would teach, that was like my day for teaching. So I would teach every Sunday and I had one of my students come in and my student, I'd seen her multiple times. So she, you know, she was a regular. And so she was like, Hey, I can't, I, I don't know. I'm kind of confused. I may not be able to take your Sunday class anymore. I was like, okay, girl, whatever. <laughs> and so she was like, but I want to have a conversation about it. I was like, oh. <laughs> and so basically what she was struggling with was that she was also super religious and she actually attended a church in DC that wasn't that far from the studio. And she's like, I am not sure that I can do your Sunday class because now my pastor, he's not seeing me on Sundays and he's in like going, what's going on? Fast forward, she comes back the next Sunday. I'm like, hey, what's up? I didn't ask her any questions. And then she's like, I need to talk some more. So then she shares that she decided to continue to come to yoga class, that she would either do the super early service on Sunday or she would just opt for like Wednesday night prayer service. So I was like, okay. And basically she said to me, she's like, your class 
is spiritually moving. Mm. And then the next words that came out of her mouth, they were fly and urban and just cool, right? Those are the words she used. And so I was like, hmm. And then I kind of like just sat on and I was like, you know, really thinking, I'm like, what, what is my class, right? What, what is that? And so I was like, it is spiritually fly. Mm. And so I told my business partner, I was like, I'm changing the name of the class to Spiritually Fly. And she goes, what is it? I was like, I don't know, girl. It's, <laughs> it's a feeling. I don't know. It's so good. It, it's Spiritually <laughs> Fly. And, it's blah, blah, blah. and so, of course, over the years, like, you know, when Instagram popped up, I tried to, it's funny, I tried to get my name, Faith Hunter, but then someone else had it. And I was like, well, we're just going to let that one go. Yeah. And I'm just going to name my IG spiritually fly because that's what I am. And then, of course, spiritually fly soon morphed into from a yoga class to workshops to really being my lifestyle. And it, that moment when I went into the, the, the first cave is what I call it in my book um, after the, you know, the toxic relationship. I came out of that with these seven principles of life. Mm. And so I was like, oh man, these are like the spiritually fly sutras. Mm, yes. <laughs> and so that's what I started teaching from with those sutras and just kind of feeling them in my body, living them in my body. And then when um, Sounds True came to me and they were like, hey, are you interested in writing a book? I was like, yeah. And then they were like, you have to call it spiritually fly. I was like, well, what else are we going to call it? I'm like, I don't right. know. <laughs> There's no other choice because it was, it's going to be filled with those seven spiritually fly sutras. And those, those are the foundation of the book. So the book has to be called spiritually fly. I love it. I love it. So yeah. take us through really briefly each sutra. And yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I don't want to miss one. So, cause sometimes I get them mixed up. I'm like, I get them uh, out of order because they're, you know, they need to be in order. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so the way that they're laid out in the book is they're like these building blocks to becoming spiritually flat. So the first one is lead with love. Mm -hmm. Number two is stand in your truth. Mm -hmm. Number three is face your demons with compassion and bravery. Number four, let down your walls, reveal your heart. Number five, trust and have faith in yourself and others. Six is follow your passions with conviction and purpose. And then seven, be divine without apologizing. Mm, that's so beautiful. Yes, I love it. Yeah. And of those seven, which one resonates with you the most right now? Be divine without apologizing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Right now I'm like... So some people may or may not know, I closed my, my second yoga studio in September. Mm -hmm. So I just, yeah, just did. And so right now I am restructuring everything that I do. Yeah. And I mean, that was 11 years of owning a business, but 11 years of committing to the DC community in a really powerful way. And so I was like, yeah, it's time to just really change things up and reflect what's truly in my heart and my soul. And that requires me to be divine unapologetically. Mm, I love that. Yeah. Cause I, I think, I think the biggest piece is that so many people see me and I don't know if you've had, you struggle with this sometimes. So many people only see me as a yoga teacher. And I'm like, I'm so much more than that. Yes. Yes. The vastness of who we are goes beyond this one aspect of something that we have done or do for a living. Right. That part. And that's so important. I'm glad you pointed that out because I want you to kind of share, like, what are the other things that you're passionate about? Um, I know you're a multi-passionate human being. I know um, 
what was it? I think at a Wonderlust Festival, we were both teaching at, you gave me some like CBD oil. And <laughs> I just, <laughs> so kind of share with people the other layers of yes. Faith Hunter. Yeah, there's so many layers. So um, I'm definitely about energy work and energy healing. Uh, one thing that I'm really focused on and in terms of sharing a lot more is actually sharing breath work. And I've been doing it for a long time, just not like putting it out there that I do it, if that makes sense, because the yoga was taking up so much space in my life. Um, Many people know that I'm really into music. And so really integrating more music and creative sound and video into the work that I do and share. I love to chat and I love to talk. So just being able to have a podcast and like start doing that and have opportunities where I'm speaking a whole lot more. I mean, I have this book that goes way beyond yoga. So it's just this opportunity for me to start doing that. I am also super passionate about women and creating safe spaces for women, but also creating safe spaces for people of color. I did that through my yoga studio, but now it's time for me to do that in a very different way. So just looking at opportunities of how I can do that both virtually and in person and ensure that my passion for supporting women and my passion for supporting people of color just doesn't happen at a retreat that I craft, but is flowing through all the work that, that I do. Our, um, my family, we also have a foundation that is named after my older brother who passed. And so right now, one of my passions is to support my younger brother in helping him get the foundation really focused. Uh, my, my older brother was a doctor, a medical doctor. And so um, he was all about women's health. Um, he was an OBGYN, but specifically he was, he worked in um, East LA, worked in Watts. And so making sure that women of color, coming back to women, um, is, is like really at the high list of the the people that we serve with our foundation. So a lot of different things. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. It's so spiritually fly. It just goes right (laughs) with the name, you know? And um, what are some of the things, especially like, you know, moving forward, like we are, you know, coming into a time where it's calling for the rise of the divine feminine and nurturing Mm -hmm. the planet. Um, What does that look like for you as you, prepare for 2022, you close the studio. What does that look like for you moving forward? Yeah, I think for me, the the most important piece that I'm working with right now is making sure that I am physically, emotionally, and spiritually whole, because I know, and this I feel like goes for anyone, like before we can go out to serve our community, before we can show up for our kids and our family, we have to be, especially for women, we have to be solid and strong and whole. And so kind of coming back to that, not apologizing, Right. creating those boundaries and saying, you know what, today I need to rest. Mm-hmm. And, that, and that's a boundary that I'll set for myself when I'm like, oh, but I know I need to go and like check those emails and like post this. And blah, blah, blah. No, I need to pause and I need to rest. Or, you know, friends go, hey, you want to go out to a restaurant tonight? I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm going to make dinner for myself and mm. nurture myself through some really healthy food. And then drop into the space that feels comfortable for me. And when I need to engage, then, then I'll go out and engage. So I think the, the key piece is making sure that I, as a woman, am whole, am solid, am nurtured, and I'm doing it myself. I say. Yeah. Yeah. I say so, so, so important. If y'all are listening out there, I hope you're taking notes because that part, that part of really nurturing yourself, that's how you're going to be able to give out more. And I think no matter how much we say, fill your own cup, fill your own cup, I think hearing it in different ways is important. Mm. And I think creating healthy boundaries is important. And 
knowing how you still can be successful and mm-hmm. take care of yourself. And if you Most need definitely. to take a year off, like you did, I mean, you have to do that, but then also finding that harmony of like, how can I pour into myself and serve others at the same time in a way that's sustainable? You know, do you feel like you found that balance or is it something that's just like an ongoing journey? I I think it's an ongoing journey, but I also, one thing I started doing like, oh my gosh, a couple of years ago is that I put my self-care time in my calendar. Mm -hmm. And so now I have a team (laughs) It's so funny because they'll see my self-care and they know, okay, Faith is getting the massage today, right? It's like, because it's in the calendar, don't book anything, don't schedule anything. And so I think that's one way, because I am, I'm, I'm a Virgo, I'm very detailed, I love my calendars. And that's one technique that I use in order to ensure that it happens. I mean, even to the point I'll put wake up in the morning, do this practice. That are, like if I'm working on a 40-day practice, there's this reminder that that, that 40-day practice is happening. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, having a calendar helps me, but I know that there are a lot of other tools that people can use. But I feel like when we are f- busy, we typically push ourselves to the side. Mm. Mm-hmm. And yeah. go, well, I really, really have to do this. And I'm like, you know what? Even if I take out five minutes, is that going to hurt the thing that I need to do? Is that going to impact? No. Five minutes. Five minutes of doing some breath work is not. Five minutes just sitting and being in in meditation and in silence is not going to negatively impact my my job, my work. That's so true. So true. So true. Nor my relationships. I think that's, you know, that's the other thing I think is really important. Yeah. Is that it's... Taking time for yourself also is crucial in all relationships, you know, those those family relationships, um, also with intimate love relationships, like letting the person know early on that I do these things for myself Mm -hmm. (laughs) and not being afraid to say it or not being able to speak up with your family and saying, you know what, I'm not going to do Thanksgiving. Yeah. I'm going to take Thanksgiving for myself this year. I mean, like, what is wrong with it? Right, right. Oh, I know some families, they're like, that's a lot wrong with that, (laughs) you know, because, you know, they feel like, oh, this is the only time I can see you. This is the time we have planned. And, you know, there's there's a lack of respect. And I think Mm -hmm. it's important that we're talking about it because there has to be a point of unconditional love. Yeah. I think it's important to talk about. So I'm so glad you brought it up where no matter what you do, you're going to be held, respected, valued, and loved. Mm -hmm. But we'll never get there if we don't know what we need. Yeah, yeah. You know, and if we're always trying to people please, like I've been reading a lot of books on like codependency and Mm -hmm. realizing like that, that, that need to always, you know, love and, and to be right and to serve there is a fine line um, mm. with that going toxic. It's really mm. easy to get resentful because people are needy by nature and they're always going to need something. <laughs> yes. And if you're constantly pouring, 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 and you're not pouring back into back yourself. Into yourself. Yeah. You're going to get resentful. You're going to feel like you're being used, taken advantage mm-hmm. of. And so I think that's why you, what you said is so, so, so important. You yeah. have to pull back by all means necessary and take care of yourself. And hopefully if a person is really down for you, they still love you. They'll still love you. They'll still love you. And that goes for any relationship that you have. And I think the note that you said is like, have that self-love. And that's the thing, like in the first, the first chapter of my book is lead with love. And what I discuss is like the foundation of everything that we're about to explore in this book is based on your self-love. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. And so that equates to everything in life that you do Mm -hmm. is related to your relationship to self. And if you don't have that depth of love, understanding, respect, compassion for yourself, how are you going to like go out in the world and do all these things Mm -hmm. and expect for others to mirror that? 
So true. Oh, and what you said when you said that something came in my mind, like, you know, because a lot of people say, you know, love God and they don't connect that loving yourself is loving God. Oh, yes. And I think that's such an important thing to talk about, especially I know we both have a spiritual background and just and I actually saw a post the other day and the post says something. Hopefully I don't butcher too bad, but it was just like you feel like God and the universe are the same. We're not, we're not the same. And Mm. I was just like, that was interesting on so many levels because it was separating God from anything, which I don't understand that God is all encompassing of everything. And then separating themselves or separating like, I, we're not the same. I'm not like you. Right. And I, I thought that was fascinating because there's a time in my life when I was there, you mm-hmm. know, so can you talk a little bit about that? Like, I don't know how you feel about that, but I feel like I want to have a conversation around it. Cause it struck me. It one, it struck me because I don't think like that now, but then it struck me as like, but you used to. Yeah. So, yeah. What do you feel about that? Yeah. So, I mean, like you said, I definitely have a a religious background. I grew up Baptist and my mother and my even my brother, my younger brother now are very, very steeped in the Baptist church. Um, However, when my brothers were diagnosed with HIV prior to that, I was like all in like I was like, God is everything. I'm like, and I was still young. Right. And I'm still I still had a relationship with God. I understood what it what my relationship was and that we were separate. God was over here and I was over here. But then when my brothers were diagnosed, I blamed God. Because I was like, wait a minute, you're supposed to be a protector. And I was like, I had all these ideas and concepts built into my psyche around what God was or is. And so then I started to hate God. Mm. And so my relationship with God was like, I was like, no spirituality, no God, no nothing. Like, no, 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 no. I've got to do, do this life myself. Right. So then when I started practicing yoga, I started to reawaken to Mm. the power of God and what that looks like. And that's when I realized I am God. God is me. God lives with inside. We are one. I am a divine creator and I create with God. I put my trust in myself. I put my trust in God. Because we're one, we're one in the same. And that now is my relationship with God. My relationship to self reinforces, amplifies my relationship with God. If I didn't have a relationship to self, it is impossible. I'm just out here reading the scripture. <laughs> just <laughs> doing, doing whatever the past to say, right? I'm like... I'm not having those conversations with myself. Therefore, I'm not having those conversations with God. Mm. Mm. That's so powerful. That's so powerful. And I think, too, when, you know, growing up and, and, you know, reading the story of Jesus and Jesus always saying, I am the way, I'm the truth, I am light, I am one with God. And I'm saying we want to be just like Jesus, but we can't say that. Like, for me, that's like a huge disconnect. It's Mm -hmm. like wait a minute. And I remember when I was young and I was told in a, in a class, like, Oh, if you, if you don't say in Jesus name, then God's not going to hear your prayer. I'm like, huh? That doesn't resonate. (laughs) Of course I didn't have a word, but I I kept, I asked my dad, I asked my mom and I was like, I don't know why, but this is, I'm not, I'm having a hard time with this. (laughs) And that was so funny, but there's so many little things that we're scared to talk about and we're scared mm-hmm. to have a conversation because if the God that I know, the God that is love, the God that is all encompassing, there's no wrong question. There is no bad mm-hmm. question. There is all love in someone trying to figure it out. How can I be one with God more? How can I serve God more? Mm-hmm. And I feel like in a spiritual, in a spiritual place, 
where there's so many different religions, how do you bring it back home, especially with a name, spiritual <laughs> fly? How do you bring it back home for people and help people really connect uh, with their truth when it comes uh, to spirituality, having so many different, you mm-hmm. know, religions and, and upbringing? I know you've seen it all and, and yeah. you've, been, you've been practicing. Yeah, I think one of the, the biggest pieces that in my teaching, I am very open in what I share around my relationship with God and what spirituality means to me. So by me not having it and people seeing that when I talk spirituality, I may reference a verse from the Bible, right? But I also will say my spirituality also will reference Oshum or Yumiya and like letting them understand that these deity, this energetic deities, these goddess energies are spirituality to me. And so I think by me being so open provides people like an opportunity to go, oh, and permission right, to say, oh, I can still do these practices and worship or have a relationship with what my definition of God is. And that's okay. And I think that's the other piece, you know, I think when we were talking about how my practice, my teaching practice has evolved, that's one of the biggest pieces where it evolved is like really being much more open about who I am, my personal beliefs, not having any fear around even saying the word God in a room. Mm. and speaking my thoughts on my relationship to the divine, when I got past that fear, it was like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And other people were like, oh, okay. So then it's like you show up to my yoga studio and there'd be, you know, Muslim women Mm -hmm. in there practicing. Right. You know, right next to a hard rocker, right? That may be an atheist. Like, and still felt safe and comfortable mm. because there was no judgment, right? And so I think that my, my beliefs and my openness creates that, that foundation and freedom for people. Mm, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think that's also important. My hope is that everyone leaves with an open heart and, and realize it doesn't matter what religion you come from, what background you come from, even what you believe coming yeah. together to, to flow and to connect. That is God, yes. you know, that is connection. Yeah. That is yoga. The, the yeah. uniting of the breath, the uniting of people. Um, that's what the practice is all about. And so oh, I, that just gave me the chills because I feel <laughs> like we're coming back home to ourselves. And when we come yeah. back home, ourselves we are coming back home to the divine we are coming back home to god because that is who we truly are that is where we are existing we cannot exist without there being a part of so any separation from anybody in the world no matter how toxic mm. and you know let's get talk, talking about the government and <laughs> ourselves from people but oh, we can't, we can't yeah. because it's, it's all connected you know and it's i like- i I try to be fair, you know, and and, and mention things that really irk me that I don't want to connect with. You know, when I when I look at someone, it's like, oh, why are they not connecting to me? It's like, Mm. well, you think about who you don't want to connect with. You know, do you Mm want to connect with like Trump? (laughs) You know, (laughs) do you want to feel like y'all the same? (laughs) Right, right, right. And, and, And it really does bring me back to a place of compassion. Yes. The place where I can come back to unconditional love and say, yes, I unconditionally love every single person on this planet. Mm. Do I hope and pray that together we can find healing and evolution and we can, you know, work on these these systems that are extremely toxic? Um, Absolutely. But that's not going to come from a place of separation. It's going to come from a place of unity, compassion, and love. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Oh, all right. So I want to kind of get into some personal favorites of yours. I love doing this at the end of the show. So (laughs) what is the favorite book you've read in the last year? Oh, my goodness. 
What? Oh my gosh. That is so hard. Eek. Okay. You can give two. <laughs> okay. 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 I'm, I'm like, I'm looking at my bookshelf right now. So I'm just like, which one was my favorite? Oh my gosh. Well, maybe I should talk about what's behind me. So I do have a fringe. So um, this book right here, Malcolm X book right here. Yeah. So the, so the name of the book is The Dead Arising. And it's, um, I don't want to say it's a biography, but it's an, an account of Malcolm X's life and things that transpired, you know, up until his, his murder. And so the thing that I love about it is that her dad was there. He was in New York, in Harlem, right at that time, you know, so he saw relationships and was involved in, you know, was present during conversations and like he witnessed things. And then, so, um, yeah, then all these, and he did a lot of interviews. That's the other thing is like, there were also tons and tons of interviews. So the research is there and just reading the book were just like some aha moments. And, um, you know, it's, it's a great book. Wow. The sound yeah, and, and she finished the project for him. So she wow. made sure that it was, it was complete. That is powerful. So powerful. I mean, it, cause it's hard. Like, you know how it is going through grief and when losing someone. For, so for her to have the power mm-hmm. to complete it. Oh, I, I can't wait to hear it. I hope it's on audible. Cause I've been, <laughs> I've been promised as like Koya, no more books. Cause I already get sent a lot of books. So it's like, I can't buy anymore. I have to listen to them, even though I love touching, feeling I do too. Smelling a book, but I, I banned myself until I actually have space um, for, for the books. Cause I have, I have books on my shelf, on my case, cases by my bed and still over the floor. Like, yeah, I just need, well, you know what, you know what I did for myself. And this is the last, when I last moved, my most recent move, my friend was like, get a box. She's a house organizer and she does some other stuff, but she said, get get a box, grab the books that you haven't picked up in the past five years. Like you haven't touched and opened up and put them all in this box and I'm going to send them to the library. Oh, that's really smart. I'm going to do I was that. like, oh, so that was great because then that like unloaded like a whole shelf. Right. And I was like, I really don't need this. This, yeah, let somebody else have that. And so it was great because, and now I don't feel too bad buying books, but I do try and purchase audibles or I'll just download them on my, my iPad or something, Kindle. I love it. Thank you so much. This has been such an amazing and fun deep dive with you. Um, Can you let everyone know um, full title of your book, where they can find it and where they can get loved up with more of faith? Yeah. So the, the full title of the book is Spiritually Fly, Wisdom, Meditations, and Yoga to Elevate Your Soul. You can find it everywhere, but if you go to faithhunter.com, there are tons of links to to grab the book, and you can select from independent um, bookstores, or you can go with the bigger ones. It's all up to you, or purchase it straight from the publisher, which sounds true. And yeah, the places where you can find me, of course, faithhunter.com. I'm also on Instagram at spiritually fly. So you can connect with me <laughs> there. And I still live in DC, even though people, I don't know where people think I live. I think I'm all over the place. Even when, during the pandemic, they're like, you're in New York. I'm like, no, I'm in DC. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so yeah. Um, so I'm in DC for now. I, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be here because now that I don't have a studio, but um, I do teach in person, but I only teach in person in DC once a month. And that is in partnership with Hotel Xena, which is part of the Viceroy um, conglomerate. And so really excited about partnering with them. And I mean, we've, I've actually been partnering with them since uh, late 2020. So we started doing outdoor events on their rooftop when they first opened. And it's, you know, coming back to women, um, their entire hotel is dedicated to empowering women. And so being in D.C. is just filled with like women artists, um, women advocates. And yeah, and they have female partnerships. And so that's one way that I'm blending in my, my passion for women is having partnerships like that. So, yeah, so you can find me live there in person. 
Awesome. Thank you so much. It's been such a treat to have you. I can't wait to see you in person and give you a big hug. Yeah, girl. I mean, I can't believe I didn't see you when I was out in LA a couple of months. I know. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm here. I'm still here. So next time you come, definitely hit me up. Definitely. And y'all, thank you so much for dropping in on this episode. I know you had some amazing takeaways. So Take a screenshot, you know, of the podcast, wherever you listen to it and just share it on Instagram. Let us know your biggest takeaway. Tag me, tag Faith. We want to see it. I love, love, love seeing it. And if you haven't left a review already, go ahead and leave a review. Let us know what you like the most about um, the Get Loved Up podcast, what, what you like the most about this episode. And until next time, love yourself, love others and love the world. One day at a time, one breath at a time. Peace and love. I just want to take a moment to say thank you for being part of the Get Loved Up community. I like to share topics and people making a positive impact in the world. And your feedback means the world to me. If you haven't already left a review, please leave a five-star review and let me know what you want to hear more of on the show. I'm here for you. And together, we're making the world a better place. One day at a time, one show at a time. Thank you for listening.